All right, welcome back. We're all having a good week and weekend. Today, we're continuing our Let's Learn ABA series with continuous measurement. Of course, continuous measurement, we're going to go over what you'll be using the most as an RBT and what you'll be using the most as a BCBA. We typically use continuous measurement more in ABA since we typically work one-on-one -on -one with our clients or students. Continuous measurement, of course, involves things like frequency and rate, duration, latency, IRT, percentage of occurrence, and trial criterion. So we'll go over all of those. Be sure to check out rbtexamreview.com for RBT materials and bcbastudy.com for BCBA materials. Questions, comments, please let me know. Work hard, study hard. Let's learn ABA. Quick intro, continuous measurement. As I said, frequency, rate, duration, latency, inter-response time, trial criterion and percentage of occurrence. Now, the first five are what you're going to be using most often. Trials to criterion, percentage of occurrence, used less often, but still useful in certain circumstances. The important thing to remember about continuous measurement is you're measuring every occurrence of a behavior. Contrast that to discontinuous measurement, where we're taking a sample of behavior, or we're only measuring during a certain interval of behavior. With continuous measurement, if you work an entire day, you're measuring throughout the entire day. Three hour session, three hour session. You get the idea. So let's start with frequency. Frequency is the simplest and the easiest to understand. It's based on the number of responses because you're simply counting how many times something occurs. If I touch my nose five times, the frequency is five. If there are three tantrums during your session, frequency is three. Very straightforward. You can use tally marks, clicker counter, iPhone app counter, or you can count in your head. I don't recommend it. It's not as accurate as using an actual tool, but it is the simplest way to measure anything. Frequency is just one component of rate. Frequency and rate are not the same thing. They're used interchangeably very often, but they're not the same. We're going to cover rate on our next slide, but remember, frequency is only one component of rate. And you can see frequency is simply counting. One, two, three four, so on and so forth. So frequency measurement is most appropriate when. When do you want to use a frequency measurement? A, you need to know how long a behavior lasted. Frequency is based on responses. We're not looking at time here. How long a behavior lasted is not going to help us with frequency. B, the response is a clear beginning and end. Yes, it's very important when you're using frequency that your response is a clear beginning and end. If you're measuring something, say, screaming, and you want to use frequency for screaming, make sure that episode of screaming has a clear beginning and end. If it doesn't, you might want to choose a different measurement type. Because remember, there's usually multiple people having to measure the behavior. With frequency, since we're counting how often something occurs, we all need to agree on, okay, this is when the behavior starts, this is when it ends, and that counts as one. C, the behavior happens at an extremely high rate. When a behavior happens at an extremely high rate and there are things going on, you're liable to miss some instances of your frequency count. So if that's the case, again, you may use some other type of measurement. And then D, you want to know the time in between responses. We're going to go over what that is, which is into response time. We're looking for when using frequency, a response that has a clear beginning and an end. Okay, so rate. Rate takes frequency and adds a time component to it. So if I were to say, yesterday my client had 10 instances of aggression. If I want to turn that to rate, I'm going to say, over the course of three hours, the client had 10 instances of aggression. Therefore, he had 3.3 instances of aggression per hour. That per is what makes it rate. You're simply taking your frequency count and quantifying it over a set amount of time. So you're combining frequency and time. Get your frequency, divide it by amount of time. You can do it by hours, minutes, seconds, whatever works for your measurement, that's what you can turn into rate. So example, frequency is 30 over a three hour session. 30 divided by three is 10. The behavior happened 10 times per hour. Practice question. So this is a tricky question meant to teach a point. The client said five words yesterday, seven today. This is a measure of what? Are we finding a rate here? Or are we simply counting how many times the client said a word? Well, all we're doing right now is counting how many times the client said a word. 
We didn't say per, we didn't have any specific set of time. Okay. All we said was yesterday we had five words. Today we had seven. We simply were counting how many words occurred. So you have to be very careful when deciding between rate and frequency. Rate is typically going to have that word per, and it's going to be very clear your time measurement. Here, all we did was count how many times the client said five words and seven today. So again, what are we measuring? We're measuring frequency. Not into response time, time in between responses, not duration, how long a response lasted, and not rate because there's no time component. Understand the difference between frequency and rate. Duration, how long a response lasts? Simple as that. Car ride lasts 30 minutes. Test lasts an hour. Class lasts three hours. Session lasts three hours. Uh, you eat for 20 minutes. You get the idea. Tantrum lasts 10 minutes. Your client screamed for five minutes. Duration, life frequency, very easy to understand, very easy to record. So you're measuring from the beginning to the end of a response. So similar to frequency, we need to have a clear beginning and a clear end in order to get accurate duration. Unlike frequency, it's based on time. So we're not counting how often it happened. We're counting how long the response happened for. For example, you start eating at 12 p.m., you finish at 12.30 p.m. The duration is 30 minutes. The client worked for 20 minutes. The duration is 20 minutes. The tangent lasts five minutes. The duration is five minutes. Duration, frequency, very straightforward, very simple. Don't overcomplicate them. You already understand what it means to take frequency or what, what when we talk about duration, what we're talking about. Don't make it harder than it is. So the client's tantrum lasted 10 minutes, 20 minutes, and 30 minutes. What is the total duration? RBTs especially expect to see questions about totals and averages. If you get a question about a total, consider yourself lucky because all you're doing is adding up the durations and getting a total. Very simple. Very straightforward. Our first tantrum lasted 10 minutes. The second one was 20 minutes. So our total duration is 30 minutes. Our last one lasted another 30 minutes. So we take 30 plus 30 and we get 60. Our total duration is 60 minutes. Very straightforward, very easy. Okay, now to the more complex types of continuous measurement, latency. So latency and inter-response time, think of them one and the same. Okay, they're part of the same grouping. Now, they represent different measurements of different things, but they work together. And I'll show you how. So, latency is the amount of time between the SD and the start of the response. So, meaning the environment changes however much time elapses until the response starts, it's our latency. Common example, your alarm clock goes off. Two minutes later, you start getting out of bed. Two minutes is our latency. And see, if we diagram it out, it's going to be from the SD to the response, two seconds, two seconds would be the latency. It's based on time. Now, look at this diagram to really get an idea of latency versus into response time. SD, so the change in the environment, to response one is two seconds. It's our latency. Response one to response two is 10 seconds. That's our into response time. See how they work together, but yet are different understand that difference. Contestants on Jeopardy need to answer within two seconds of the question being asked in order to have a chance at winning. What are we measuring? Well, are we measuring time in between responses or time in between answers or the time in between the environment changing where the question is asked to the time they answer the question? Well, we're measuring the time from the question being asked to the answer starting, which is two seconds. Therefore, we're measuring latency. It's not duration. We're not measuring how long the answer is. Not frequency. We're not measuring how many times they answer. Not into response time. We're not measuring time in between answers. We're measuring the time from the SD of the question being asked to when the answer starts. We're measuring latency. And then into response time, the amount of time between the end of a response and the start of the next. So if we look at our diagram, response one to response two is into response time. Response two to response three, into response time based on time. Let's go back to our latency graph. SD to response one is latency. Response one to response two into response time. So they are essentially, you're essentially using the same strategy to measure latency and into response time. You're just measuring different occurrences of time. Simple as that. 
So when it's a response time can typically go on as long as there are responses. Now, one thing to remember about enter response time is you want responses similar in function, similar in topography, similar in response class, essentially. You don't want to be measuring the difference between screaming and completing math problems, okay? Not going to tell you a lot, typically. Typically, with enter response time, you're going to want behaviors or responses in the same sort of response class, okay? So just remember this graph. SD to response one is latency. Response one to response two, enter response time. It took the student five minutes to start his exam. The student took 30 seconds from question one to two, 20 seconds from two to three, and 30 seconds from three to four. What is the average into response time? All right. Confusing if we're not really careful. So into response time, time in between responses. What is the response in this question? I'm going to be answering questions. So from question one to two, it took 30 seconds. So our first IRT. Two to three was 20 seconds, second IRT. Three to four is 30 seconds, third IRT. So how do we find average? We add up all of our data, get a total, and divide it by the amount of data points. So 30 plus 30 is 60. 60 plus 20 is 80. We have three data points. To get our average, we're going to divide 80 by three and get 27 seconds. If you don't understand how to find averages, go work on them. Both RBTs and BCBAs need to know for the exam, how to find totals, how to find averages. The hardest part about this type of question is identifying what is the measurement, what are we measuring? The averaging part should be the easy part. So our answer here is 27 seconds. Okay, and percent of occurrence and trials to criterion. So let's start with percent of occurrence. It's the number of responses divided by number of opportunities. So think about the name, percent of occurrence. It's basically saying, how many times did a response occur based on opportunities? If I give you 20 shots to make a basket, how many baskets did you make? If you made 10, your percent of occurrence is 50%. That's the idea. Another example, you ran 10, 10 trials with your client. They answered it correctly six times. The percent of occurrence is going to be 6 over 10 or 60%. The answering occurred 60% of the time. Think about it like that. It occurred what percentage of the time? How many times did something happen and how many opportunities were given? Over the course of an hour, you observe instances of your client saying no. The first three times, the stakeholder asks the client something and the client says no. The next two times, the client says, I'm ignoring you. What was the percent of occurrence of no? Again, the hardest part of these questions, identifying what measurement and what behavior. We're using percentage of occurrence. So what occurrence did no happen? What percent of the occurrence did no happen? Let's see. You observe instances of your client saying no. The first three times, the client said no. The next two, the client says, I'm ignoring you. So of occurrences, of the opportunities, which were five, what percentage did no occur? Well, three. So all we're going to do is divide three over five and get 60%. Again, the easy part is the math. No, calculation isn't difficult. It's identifying the behavior and the type of measurement. Finally, trials to criterion. How many opportunities did it take to achieve mastery? So I set a criterion. I need you to get three in a row. How many trials will it take for you to get three in a row correct? It's simple as that. It took your client eight tries to reach mastery. Trials to criterion, eight. Okay, don't overcomplicate it. You can set your own criterion. Example, you want your client to answer correctly three times in a row. It takes your client 12 tries to answer three times in a row. Trials to criterion would be 12. It took 12 trials to reach criterion. Simple as that. Which of the following sequences represents a criterion of four 100% in a row? What is our criterion? Four 100% in a row. We haven't mastered it. We haven't met criterion until this occurs. Okay. So let's look at A, 90, 100, 90, 100, 100, 100. We have not achieved our criterion. B, 100, 80, 80, 100, 80, 90, 100, 100. We need four in a row. Didn't get it. C, four, 100, 100, 100, 100. Okay, we've achieved it. So how many trials to criterion? Well, let's just count how many trials it took to master. One, two, three, four, five. Five trials to master, five trials to criterion. Our answer is 
Let's see. Finally, what do you need to know? Continuous measurement, most accurate type of measurement because we are measuring every instance of a behavior. Requires more time and resources, which is why discontinuous measurement is often used in large groups or classrooms with multiple clients. And you need to know the types, rate, frequency, duration, enter response time, latency, percent of occurrence, and trust criterion. Also, know how to find totals, know how to find averages, know the math. Okay, thanks for watching. Check out bcbastudy.com for our BCBA study materials and rbtexamreview.com for RBT materials. Questions, comments, please let me know. I'd love to help. Work hard, study hard. See you soon.